we manage money in um, we manage money across global markets. So, and then we also have dedicated golden resource accounts. Now, clearly, if someone gives you five percent or ten percent of their portfolio dedicated to gold, that person tends to want to be invested. If a person gives you half a million, that's all their portfolio for a conservative global account. I don't have to buy gold or resources if I don't want to. So I make the, so so that's a distinction to make at the beginning. It depends an awful lot on the client, to be honest. But you know, right now I would say we're pretty fully invested with our gold and silver allocation, whatever that means. If someone gave us money for gold, we're fully invested in in the, in the global accounts, whatever allocation we have for gold and silver. We're pretty full right now, and I, I'll, you know, I'll admit, um, you know, perhaps we did a reasonably good job at, at trimming some positions in in February and March, but we bought back far too soon, and you know that's not uncommon for value investors. So we're fully invested there. In the resources, generally, I tell you, it really varies from one to the other. But generally speaking, we've got a lot of dry powder available for for other resources, and that would include everything from you know energy to well, uranium is energy. Everything from the energy sector to the base metals, agriculture, and everything. So we're invested, but we've got we've got a lot of dry powder there. And would you keep the dry powder for fear of a recession and a further sell-off, or what would be the rationale between keeping a lot of dry yeah. powder right now? It, it really depends on the commodity, but generally there'd be two things. One would be the recession, particularly a recession in China, which remains, you know, the dominant uh, demand uh, uh, source for most resources. That would be number one, and then number two would be the war in in Ukraine. You know. If or when that ends, um, I think there'll be some sell-offs in some of the commodities that have responded particularly well, particularly positively to that event. So, for example, oil and gas. Yeah, you, you know, if 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 you if the Ukraine situation, you know, ended tomorrow, uh, whatever happens with broad sanctions against Putin and everything else, I think the sanctions on oil, Russian oil and gas would be lifted pretty quickly. Because that's what the West needs, and in that in that case, I, I think the oil price, the oil and gas price prices could drop fairly significantly, very quickly. Now, longer term, I'm bullish on both of those, very bullish, in fact. Um, but I'm waiting for, you know, I'm waiting for those events. In your experience, you know, as commodity investors, I think as you alluded to, we can often be too early. Well, how do you define? being too early equating to being wrong like when when you do your self-assessment uh, can you give any examples maybe from your own investing career you know sometimes being too early is just a euphemism for being wrong i i think a lot depends on the time frame that you gave yourself when you made the investment in the first place so if i if i buy franco nevada for example or nestle Outside the resource area, which I'm buying as a long-term investment for long-term exposure to those various sectors or areas, um, with a reasonable dividend in both times, but with dividend growth in both cases, it's a long-term investment. Well, if I'm if the stock goes down for six or twelve months, that doesn't really detract from 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 the thesis. Um, if 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 I bought Ajax Exploration because they had some drill, drill a drill program coming out, well, you know, if if I'm wrong by two weeks, then that's a mistake. So I think a lot depends on the on the uh, time horizon and the objective for which you bought something. What about the gold stocks and gold sentiment, Adrian? Like, in, based in your historical perspective, you've been at this quite a bit. How do you rate sentiment right now? Certainly among generalists. Sentiment towards gold and silver is worse than the negative. It's they just don't care. Uh, so the sentiment among generalists, I would say, is is pretty much the worst I've ever seen. And and we might get in, into the generalist a little bit later. Small ebook, big impact, the wealth tree, the only four ways that will make you financially free forever. 
Download it here for free. You know, I think there's a bit of, I, I'm seeing two, two types of people. I'm certainly seeing newer investors who are saying, by newer, I mean the last, you know, two, three years, as, as you can tell from my comments, I tend to take a long-term approach to things. Um, certainly seeing newer investors who regret ever having bought gold and silver. Um, you know, why did I ever get involved in this market? Now, typically, as we were discussing beforehand, typically, and this is not a criticism of the investors, typically these are people who chase performance. I know when I look at my, my managed accounts over 30 years, I've been doing it 30 years now, um, we tend, well, when we get clients close, other than, you know, deaths, when we get clients close, I would say the vast majority of those are people who've only been open a year or two. And then when you look at it, you see, oh yeah, we had really good performance in, you know, 1987, and they all closed in 1999. But people who've been around for a while, they've seen the cycles, they understand the inherent volatility, and they tend to be a little more, a little more, a little more tolerant. So with regard to sentiment now, there's no question that the people who have, you know, what we'll call, you know, dedicated gold investors are frustrated that gold hasn't gone up more given the inflation and given the war. But I think over the last few months, as more and more people, including myself and you, have begun to explain why gold is where it is and why it really isn't as bad as you know it might look on, on the surface, uh, I think people have become a little more comfortable or, or accepting, accepting of that. Yeah, I think both of those are right, or both of those are true to some extent. I don't necessarily think we need to see the broad market collapse, but we certainly need to see the broad market um, you know, stop going up and people start to rotate. There's already been rotation from the tech stocks, tech growth stocks into the value stocks and more defensive stocks changed a little bit in the last you know, few weeks, but we were seeing a lot of that rotation. And I think you know, a decline in the broad market, not a collapse, we'll see rotation into, in, into gold. I, I definitely think we need to see the gold price higher um, on a sustained basis. And it doesn't necessarily have to be new all-time highs, but if we start getting over 1800 and 1850 and then 1900, to me, would be a trigger for a lot of interest to come back to the sector. But it has to sustain it. Uh, with regard to the gold stocks, the gold equities, I think there's one other factor, and that is, you know, the generalist wants to see consistent performance, and you know, those of us who are in this sector, we know. We know that the gold market and, and particularly the equities are inherently volatile. You can't get away from that. It's a very volatile business. It's also a very risky business. We know that. And, you know, it's, it's only going to get worse, in my view, as time goes on. We're, we've already got all the good, all the, well, we haven't got all of them. That's not quite true. But certainly Nevada, for example, has been well picked over. And, you know, where are you seeing the really big deposits now, whether it's gold or copper? You're seeing them in the Congo or you're seeing them in Pakistan. Well, the generalist is just not comfortable with some of those places. In addition, those places give you not only additional risk, but they give you constant headline, you know, stomach aches, um, whether it's coups or new taxes or, you know, not letting the money out of the country or whatever it is. So again, if you're in the business, you're, you're, you're accepting of that, even if you're not comfortable of it. If you're, if you're a generalist, you know, and you're used to investing in Nestle, for example, um, buying, buying stocks that go up and down by 30% in the space of a couple of months uh, is, is just not something you can accept. And I think that's one of the reasons why generalists have become increasingly comfortable with the royalty and streaming uh, companies which, although they're not uh, immune to volatility by any means, you know, again, we know that, um, but they're not immune to it, but they're certainly a lot less volatile and they're a lot less volatile on a very short-term basis. So the generalist is more accepting of that.